In the next half hour, what I want to do is I want to give you a state of the union on artificial intelligence. I want to describe what's working, what's not working. I want to hit some of the hot topics around AI that you'll read about in the papers all the time. And if I were to fast forward to the punchline, here's the punchline. AI has come roaring out of the research labs where it was invented. All of the big companies, big tech companies on the planet are adopting AI first strategies. So in the US, that's GAFA, Google, Amazon, Facebook, Apple. In China, it's BAT, it's Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent. And now, it's your turn. It's your turn in the Global 2000 and government organizations to ask the question, what can I do with AI inside my organization? So that's the punchline. Let's get right into it. So fundamentally, I believe that AI is going to get into every piece of software that we write in almost exactly the same way that databases got inside all the software. Databases were awesome at storing things and counting things and running reports. AI is good at a very different set of things. It's good at seeing what's inside pictures. It's good at understanding language. It's good at making predictions. And because these things are so valuable, they're going to get inside all of the applications, just like databases did. As I mentioned, AI has come roaring out of the research labs. This graph shows you registrations at one of the big AI conferences on the planet. It call, it's called NIPS. And you see that blue line that's sort of straight up and to the right? That's this year's registrations. If you just do a straightforward extrapolation of those numbers, the entire world's population will be at NIPS in 2040. So I will see you there. CEOs are mentioning it on earnings calls. The Economist ran this graphic. We now have 300 earning calls this year where the CEO said something about artificial intelligence being central to their strategy. And the politicians have gotten into the act, too. So Vladimir Putin famously said in an interview that the nation that leads AI will be the ruler of the world. So why all this hyperbole, you could argue? Because it's working. And in the next 15 minutes, I'm going to go through a ton of examples where it's working, not only with the small companies and startups, but with the big companies. And hopefully, it's an inspiration for you as you think about where can I use AI inside my organization. So we'll do it in a couple categories. Let's start first by talking about seeing in the real world. Our friends at Pinterest have tons of pins, lots of pictures behind those pins. And Pinterest can look inside these pictures to figure out what's in this picture. If you look in this picture, you'll see an overcoat, a scarf, a hat, a purse, boots. If you zoom in on any one of those things, Pinterest will figure out what's in that picture and then show you related ones, because it can see. Our friends at Airware help you help mine operators operate safely. Now, I didn't know this, but there's a rule for mine operations, which is you have to have your lanes marked. This is where all the trucks, mining trucks go. And you don't paint lane markers like we do on the freeway. Instead, what you do is you put rocks to indicate lanes. And the rule is the rocks need to be twice as tall as the tallest wheel on your mining equipment. That's what keeps them safe. Before AI, literally, people walked out with clipboards and yardsticks to figure out if they were in compliance. Airware instead gathers data from drones and then analyzes it. And you can see the results of that analysis. The red rocks are not tall enough. The green rocks are tall enough. Let's talk about understanding language. How many people use one of these at home or on their phone, Siri, Alexa? It's gotten crazily good at understanding what you're saying. Not so good at having a conversation with you. I'll come back to that. But hearing the words that you say. This is called automated speech recognition. In the old days, we used to call it speech to text. Given an audio input, let me tell you the words that came out of it. It turns out that the quality metric for this is called word error rate. How many words do you get wrong? Human word error rate is about 5 or 6%. If you talk to a human, they will get 5 or 6% of the words wrong. The algorithms are now at 4% and falling. As a result, this is why Siri can understand what you're saying. It's the same technology that allows YouTube to subtitle their videos which they've done for a billion YouTube videos with no human involvement. Not only do they capture what the people are saying, so the words, but they'll also get the sound effects. So go turn on closed captioning for one of these YouTube videos, and you'll see in the subtitles, muffled explosion, gunshot, tense music. So the AIs are even categorizing those things in the soundtracks. 
Facebook uses this technology to translate posts. Over watching you do what you do, it learns what language, languages you speak. And if it sees a post in your newsfeed in a language you don't speak, it will offer to translate it. So there's a translate this post button that you can push and it will translate it for you. Sometimes it'll translate it automatically and you might wonder, wait, where's the button? Well, it does that when its confidence about the translation is so high that it doesn't even need to offer. It's just gonna do it because it's confident it got the right thing. Our friends at Everlaw use this natural language processing technology to help lawyers prepare for trials. The first step of any trial is you're gathering a mountain of information. You've got Word documents, you've got emails, you've got transcript of audio calls. The first task is to figure out which of these documents should I pay attention to? Which ones are relevant to my case? Which ones will I need to turn over to the opposing counsel because of the rules of trials? Instead of using paralegals to do this, Everlaw uses a set of natural language processing techniques to do the translations, to do the transcriptions, and most importantly, to cluster the documents by topics so that you can look at the most important documents first. Making predictions. Our friends at Airbnb use machine learning to help you get the best price for your house or room if you decide to list it on Airbnb. So for example, if you live in Austin, there's two seasons where your house is worth a lot more. That's South by Southwest, and that's the City Lights Festival. And you'll know that South by Southwest actually is a lot more people, which means that your room is worth a lot more. So to not leave money on the table, they will recommend a price that they think your room will clear at. Now the other thing they did, which is very interesting, is they ranked photos. So this is fundamental to artificial intelligence. It's a technique called supervised learning. And supervised learning looks like this, which is you take a data set, and then you have humans annotate that data. In this case, we took the photos and we had them rank the photos on attractiveness. Now Airbnb did this with two very different set of people. One set of people were professional photographers and architects. The other set of people were the ones who booked rooms. And as you might imagine, the two groups of people ranked the photos very differently. The photographers were looking for rooms that would end up in the pages of Architectural Digest magazine. Whereas the travelers were looking for cozy bedrooms, kitchens that look friendly that they want to cook in. So very different. So one of the lessons that we learned from this is that if you're going to use supervised learning in one of your applications, the people that are assigning the labels are very important. And you've got to pick the right set of people to do the annotations for the predictions to turn out correctly. Foursquare uses machine learning techniques to figure out if you're near a venue, like the fabulous Encore. And then, once it figures out you're near a venue, it will pick a set of photos and recommendations to show you. The recommendations are picked by machine learning. And basically, what they're looking for is the most useful tips. So in database land, we could have picked the most recent tips. We could have picked the most accessed tips, the most viewed. But you couldn't do something like most useful. There's no SQL query for show me the most useful. But with machine learning, what we've done is we've added the capability to ask and answer that question. Which tips are most useful? Instacart uses prediction techniques to help get shoppers through the grocery store faster. They went through this in two waves. Wave one was they used traditional machine learning techniques, things like gradient-boosted decision trees. And they got a 3 or 4% lift in the speed at which shoppers got through the supermarkets to get your groceries. Then they used newer techniques called deep learning, and they got another 3 or 4% boost. So the lesson here is that you don't have to start with deep learning. You can use some existing machine learning techniques, and then you can improve over time. And the gains are additive. The things that you found with one technique added to the gains that you found with the next technique are additive. Our friends at Cardiogram gather data off your Apple Watch or Android smartwatch, mostly heartbeat data. And as you might expect, they were able to figure out if your heart was doing something funky. Atrial fibrillation was something that they could detect. It's a predictor of strokes. You'd like to know whether your heart is beating in an irregular fashion. What might surprise you is that they were able to use the exact same data. And keep in mind, this is an Apple Watch. This is not a medical grade device. Using that exact same data, they were able to predict whether you had sleep apnea. They were able to predict hypertension. And these things, traditionally, you'd have to have dedicated medical devices for. 
But just off the heartbeat data, we can predict whether you have hypertension. We don't need to put the cuff on you to manage your blood pressure, to measure your blood pressure. We can just compute it and estimate it off of the heartbeat data. Now, increasingly, we're able to do more and more sophisticated types of recommendations. AI turns out to be a pretty good soccer coach. So the way this works is today, soccer players, like most professional athletes, wear sensors so that we know exactly where they are on the field every second of the game. And if we take that into consideration, where are the players, where's the ball, we can now calculate what's the probability that my team is going to get scored on in the next 30 seconds, given this configuration of people. And we can compare my team versus the best team in the league, and that's what you see on the far left, that's my team. On the far right is the best team in the league. You'll see that my team has a 69% chance of getting scored on because of where the players are. The best in the league has only a 42% chance of getting scored on. So now I can be a soccer coach because I can give concrete guidance to each player about what to do. You need to be closer to the ball. You need to be close to an offensive player. You need to be closer to the goal post. All right, autonomy. We have a company called Shield.ai. The founder is here. Please talk to him if you are interested in what they do. They build a drone that you can drop off at the beginning, the opening of a building. The drone will fly into the building, create a 3D map of that building, as well as identify the people in it. Today, we use young people with guns to do this exact same task. Of course, we should be doing it with drones to take the young people out of harm's way. Our portfolio company, Zipline, is delivering blood where it's needed throughout Western Rwanda. There's one place they collect blood in Western Rwanda. There are tons of places they need it. But sometimes it's dangerous or time consuming to get to the place that's where the blood is needed. And so instead of sending a truck that might get there over hours, literally what they can do now is they have a smartphone app. They say, I need two liters of Oneg right now. In half an hour, the blood literally drops out of the sky by parachute carried by the drone. They're doing 500 deliveries a day in this fashion. I love this story. This is a portfolio company of ours that spun out of Udacity. Udacity, as you, as you might know, is an e-learning platform where people can learn new skills. There was a team that built the self-driving engineer curriculum. And they were so excited by the first set of students who went through it. They were so impressed with the quality of the work. They said, you know what? Maybe let's not build the next generation curriculum. Maybe let's build a company. And that's exactly what they did. They spun out of Udacity, created this company called Voyage. Nine months after they spun out, they turned on a self-driving taxi service in a retirement community in San Jose. Nine months. That's how good the underlying infrastructure for AI has gotten. You take a people who were one day building curriculum to teach other people how to do this magic. Nine months later, there's a self-driving taxi service in San Jose. One other thing that I want to share is, uh, from an investing point of view, obviously we're looking for great companies that are using AI. We're also looking for great companies that help other people do AI. Call this the picks and shovels investment strategy. During the gold rush, you can either find a gold prospector, give them a bunch of money, or you can invest in the companies making picks and shovels and Levi's. This is that strategy. We have a company called Databricks that's rapidly becoming the default computing platform for people building their AI models. It turns out one of the things that you need to build really good AI models is you need a lot of data, and typically a lot of computers. And so what Databricks does is it makes it very easy for somebody writing a machine learning model not to worry about all of the machines and how to distribute the data and how to run compute on those. Databricks takes care of all of that. They can focus on the core algorithm work. How can I make this model a better predictor of what I want it to predict? Then once you have a model, you can use technology from our company called SIGOPT. And the way to think about what SIGOPT does is every one of these AI models, think of it, they have dozens to hundreds of knobs that you can turn. In the technical community, they're called hyperparameters, because the technical community likes long words that make no sense. They're hyperparameters. And so think you can sort of turn these knobs, and every time you turn the knob, you'll get a slightly different set of predictions. What SIGOP does is automatically turn the knob so that they're in the right place so that you get the best predictions. So I gave you a long list of what's working. A ton is working. What's not working? So to frame that, what I want to do is sort of describe three maturity models for AI. Everything that I've talked about to date is what's called narrow AI because it's single purpose. 
The Pinterest algorithms that recognize the purse inside those pins doesn't help Everlaw sort documents. And those algorithms don't help Voyage navigate its car. All of them are built for that single purpose, hence narrow AI. Now, you and I are not like that. You and I learn new things all the time. You might have learned to ice skate, or ski, or do double entry bookkeeping, or learn HTML. You learn new things all the time, and yet you and I only have the one brain. So this is the holy grail of AI research. How do we build a set of algorithms and data structures that can be applied to very, very different learning tasks and be successful at all of them? And we don't really have a consistent research agenda that will lead us there. If you ask 100 machine learning researchers what's the path to general AI, most of them will say, I don't know. Um, and then we'll get a lot of other opinions. Maybe it's more deep learning. Maybe it's reinforcement learning. Maybe we need to do evolutionary algorithms. Maybe we need to mimic the brain more explicitly. So there's all kinds of approaches to general AI, but there's no consistency on the path. And until we get to general AI, in other words, it can learn like humans learns in lots of different domains, I don't think we need to worry about the far right thing, which is what Elon Musk is talking about, which is the super AI, which is not only do we have learning algorithms that are as good as humans at learning all of these things, it's become better than humans in all of these ways. Andrew Ng, who is one of the foundation researchers in this area said, I worry about super AI in exactly the same way that I worry about overpopulation on Mars which is one day we might have to worry about overpopulation on Mars. But first, Elon Musk needs to get the first batch of us there. And even that seems far away. So where we are is narrow AI is working, although I'm going to show you a few examples where it's not. We don't really have a consistent research agenda that will get us to general AI. And as a result, I'm not too worried about the super AI quite yet. So let me show you some examples where narrow, even narrow AI isn't at human performance. If you're interested in these types of things, the Electronic Frontier Foundation has helpfully assembled a report card for tons of AI tasks, and they'll tell you where we are. Um, I've picked three at random to show you. Here's AI systems that are nowhere close to human performance. Task one, I'm going to give you a picture, and then I ask you arbitrary questions about that picture. Now, you might be surprised. I already told you the Pinterest can look inside every picture and show you the hats and the scarves. And the, so what's, what's going on here that's different? What's going on here that's different is that it was looking for a set of objects that it knew to look for, like hats. This task involves asking arbitrary questions. I didn't prepare the system in advance. I'm just going to show you the picture. And I'll ask you a question like, in those middle set of pictures, is the umbrella upside down? Every four-year-old instantly can get that question. AIs are not able to answer arbitrary questions given a picture quite yet. Example two, same thing, but with Wikipedia articles instead of photos. So read a Wikipedia article and then answer questions. So read Nikola Tesla's biography in Wikipedia and then answer the question, what was his ethnicity? You don't have to be a genetic expert or a sociologist to answer that question. You can just read it out of the article. What is the United Methodist Church's theological orientation? Again, you don't have to be a theologian. You can just read the Wikipedia article. You will figure this out, but the AIs, not so much. One last example. This one makes me feel better. Answering fourth grade science exam questions. So you've answered hundreds of questions just like this over the years. What organisms in this food chain are needed for all the other organisms to survive? It's the plants, yeah. AIs are not good at answering these types of questions. And so you get a sense that even in narrow AI, there's a big gap between human performance and computer performance. And so to get to even more general intelligence, in other words, we can learn new things on the fly, we're pretty far away. There's been a lot of tests proposed for how would we know if we have a general AI. The most famous of these is the Alan Turing's Turing test. So he says, look, imagine that you're chatting with somebody. And if you can't tell if the other person on that chat conversation is a computer or human, then we'll know we have a general AI. Because think of all the questions that you could ask them to try to trick them. What did you learn from your mother would be a good question. Steve Wozniak proposed a slightly different test. He calls this the coffee test. Imagine that you got a brand new robot, literally something like Rosie the robot. You unpack it in your living room. You're so excited. You say, robot, go make me some coffee. Steve Wozniak says, by the time a robot can understand that and figure out a, a strategy to go make you some coffee, then we'll know that we've gotten general AI. Again, 
There's no consistent research approach to getting here. We don't know the fundamental things that we need to solve. There are a lot of unknown unknowns to getting to this level of performance. In fact, if you ask one of the grand masters of research in this area, a guy named Jeffrey Hinton, who has doggedly pursued this thing, this set of algorithms called deep learning for now three decades. He's affiliated with the University of Toronto and now at Google. He says, I think we need a reboot. I think the path that I set everybody on, and fundamentally an algorithm called backpropagation, I think that's a dead end. I think if we want general intelligence, we're going to need to invent a new technique. We're going to need a reboot. All right. Let me talk a, uh, about a couple of the super controversial things now that we know sort of what's working, what's not. Here's what you'll read in the press all the time. Thing number one you'll read in the press is China is going to kick our ass. And they're going to do so because they've got a coordinated national policy that says, I want to be number one in AI by 2030. If you look today, most of the foundational ideas, technologies, algorithms, data structures have come from the Western universities. It's Google's DeepMind, it's the University of Toronto, it's Stanford. But also, if you look today, the number of deep learning papers in China has outnumbered the number of deep learning papers, but the number of citations in those papers still tilts towards the West. The most influential papers are Western papers. China says no more. By 2030, I want to be publishers of the most influential papers. And they're coordinating a national policy to achieve this end. They're introducing curriculum into every middle school to start deep learning training. They have funds set aside to attract immigrants and expatriates, Chinese citizens who have come to get trained at Western universities and Western companies, to come back to China. They call this the Thousand Talents Program. So instead of trying to repel the immigrants at the border, they say, not only are we not going to repel you, we're going to pay you money to come so that you do deep learning here in China. You do artificial intelligence research. And then there's another thing going on in China which is super interesting, which is their attitude towards data privacy is very different. Basically, everybody in China knows that they're being surveilled at all moments. Every app you use, everything that you buy in an Alibaba store, every store that you walk into, you're being analyzed by algorithms. And if it's true that data is the lifeblood of artificial intelligence, that without data that's labeled, you're not going to be able to produce models that are accurate, maybe they will get a lead. And so I think we need to start thinking in the West about what we can do to imitate some of these techniques. How about let's start with not repelling immigrants? How about we start with a clearinghouse where everybody can contribute labeled data sets once they've gotten the research grant and disabled that data? So I think we need to imitate some of the things that we know are working well in China. All right, thing number two. The other thing that you read all the time in the press is about Skynet and the Terminator. So today, I want to put a very different movie character in your head to personify artificial intelligence. Please meet Jiminy Cricket. Jiminy Cricket was Pinocchio's guide in life, sat on his shoulder, saw everything that Pinocchio did, and had words of wisdom for him at the right moment. And I'm convinced over the next 20, 30 years, dozens if not hundreds of billion dollar companies will get created building Jiminy Cricket. It's ways telling you to take the side street instead of the freeway. It's Instacart saying, go down aisle three. You need something from that right now. It's a soccer player getting coached by their soccer coach. It's the Airbnb host not leaving money on the table. In all these little ways, the artificial intelligence has made the human smarter, more effective. And I think we're at the golden age of producing technologies just like this. And then finally, hot button three, I'm going to talk about jobs. We've been talking about it throughout the conference. AI is going to eat all the jobs. Now, it turns out automation has been about to eat all the jobs for every, uh, Mark said, 300 years. I think that's about right. We started writing about it in the press 100 years ago. And basically, every decade and every technological advance has unearthed a trove of headlines about how automation was going to take all the jobs. The looms are going to take all the jobs. The tractors are going to take all the jobs. The semiconductors are going to take all the jobs. Robotic manufacturing equipment going into the car factory is going to take all the jobs. Microsoft Office, oh my god, you saw that room full of people that were the Excel spreadsheet. It did eat all their jobs. But it turns out the economy created new jobs for people. And that fundamentally has to do with the fact that you and I are always craving new stuff and new services. You didn't know you wanted an iPhone until Steve showed you one 10 years ago. 
You didn't know you wanted to go to Zumba class until that became a thing. And so if you look at jobs that got created in the last 10 and 20 and 30 years ago that didn't exist prior to that point, there's tons of jobs because we have an infinite appetite for new products and services. And so I'm an optimist on these things. I think so long as we have the capacity to want new things, we will always be creating jobs to satisfy those demands. Well-being coach, college counselor, fracking engineer, millennial consultant, admissions consultant, Airbnb host, all of these jobs didn't exist until we created them because we wanted new stuff or new services. Peter Levine in the previous session told the story of the ATMs. Here are those numbers behind it. You would have expected the ATMs to wipe out all of the bank teller jobs. The bottom line is the number of ATMs deployed. The top line is the number of bank tellers. This is a very counterintuitive history lesson in the deployment of automation. And the reason this happened was part regulatory. It became easier for banks to compete across state lines. And then part business strategy, which is Wells Fargo and Bank of America decided, the way I'm going to compete with the other bank is to open a branch in your neighborhood. And I'm going to compete on convenience. And it's the ATMs that made it possible for them to execute this strategy, because when they opened up the branch in your neighborhood, they could hire 10 people instead of 100, because they could put the ATM in there. And as a result, both numbers went up. We see this exact same phenomenon with Amazon. Oh, by the way, Amazon is also one of the most aggressive deployers of robots in history. And both numbers are going up, human workers and robots. So I tell these stories just to say, it's not always easy to predict what will happen with automation. So I want to conclude by talking about what this means for your organization. Remember I said, it's your turn in the Global 2000. One of the famous researchers in AI saying, like, research might have plateaued a bit. We might be reaching a, uh, an area where we're not innovating as fast anymore. But that's OK, because even if we stopped the research pipeline today and said no more research is coming out of the universities, I think we have 20, 30, 40 years of software development to do to put all the AI inside the apps. So the first thing that you've got to do is you've got to pick a set of apps that you want to try. You can do it with your existing products. You can do it against your annual corporate objectives. You can do it thinking of new products and services to sell. AI can help every one of those areas. So pick your first five, 10 projects. And having picked them, you can buy it or build it. One of the things that I'll invite you to do, which is if you're evaluating the, uh, software from a vendor and they don't have a pretty sophisticated machine learning roadmap that says, here's how my product gets smarter, makes better predictions, helps you save money, you should send them home because their competitor will have one, have a product roadmap that has machine learning in it, and theirs is just going to be better. Now, if you can't buy it, you can have custom software built for you. We have a portfolio company called Gigster, which will assemble a high-class team to build software to your specifications. Machine learning is a big part of their portfolio these days. Now, if you can't buy it, either bespoke or custom or off the shelf, then you can build it. You can add AI to your apps by calling APIs. So given a picture, the APIs will tell you what's in it. Given a sentence, it'll tell you if somebody's angry. So you can add AI capabilities easy by just calling APIs that are available on the cloud. And then if you need to build your own models, all of the public cloud vendors, and I talked about our picks and shovels companies, have provided products to make that easier and easier every day. Finally, you got to train your people. The good news is you don't need to send them back to Stanford or MIT to get a PhD, although that would be awesome. It turns out that you can send them to Udacity, and in six months, they have a machine learning nano degree that's useful inside your organization. So the cost of training your people and equipping them has come down. Let me show you one last, hopefully, inspirational example for you. This is the story of Makiko Koike. He was an auto engineer in Japan. He decided, I don't really want to work on cars anymore. I'm going to go home to the family farm. So that's what he did. His family happened to be cucumber farmers. And after the harvest, his mom would have to sort all the cucumbers that were harvested into nine different grades. In Japan, they're very fussy about the appearance of their fruits and vegetables. And so there's nine grades of cucumbers, each which commands a different price at market. So being the dutiful son, he said, Mom, I'm going to automate this for you. He bought himself a Raspberry Pi, a couple actuators to push things into boxes. He used TensorFlow to train 
the AIs to look for the nine grades of cucumbers. And for under $2,000, he automated cucumber sorting. $2,000. So my challenge to you is, what's the cucumber sorter inside your organization? Where can you spend $2,000 and get some serious automation? Delight your customers. Lower your costs. They're in there. It's your challenge to go find them as we merge out of this AI winter into an AI spring. Thank you.